Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in to this discussion on Beyond the UN Water Conference, Leaders on What's Next. I'm Tanya Strauss, Head of Food and Water at the World Economic Forum. And it's my privilege to host this important conversation which is being broadcasted on our World Economic Forum platforms and through our partners at YouTube and LinkedIn. 3.6 billion people are water insecure. That is nearly half our global population, and our demand for this precious resource is only growing. Meanwhile, availability and access to water is grossly misunderstood to be infinite. And as a society and as economies, we are not taking care to value this limited global common good. And this changes now. 
Last week, the UN convened the first water conference in almost 50 years here in New York, co-chaired by the governments of the Netherlands and Tajikistan. A watershed moment, an opportunity to take on a shared responsibility across the public, social, and private sectors, where leaders, institutions, and individuals committed to stewardship for water action through dedicated partnerships, finance, and innovation on water action, and a unanimous call for stronger commitments to breaking the silo within the water community to show that taking action on water protects livelihoods and economic resilience of people, especially of the most vulnerable communities, but also business supply chains. It achieves food security and a better way to produce and consume our food. It helps safeguard nature and Earth's ecosystems. And yes, water is helping us achieve tough goals on climate change faster, both related to mitigation and adaptation. We already have many of the solutions, many of the technologies. Now we need to invest at scale in deploying those existing and fostering entrepreneurship for those technologies and solutions to develop new fit-for-purpose strategies and with speed. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Hank Ovink, Special Envoy for Water from the Government of the Netherlands. Welcome, Hank. You've been working tirelessly for years and certainly in the last 12 months, traveling around the world, raising awareness, creating a mobilization of leaders across sectors for water action. Was the conference a success? And what are your key takeaways for our public today? Thanks, Tanya, and uh, thanks all for uh, joining. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here again at the Forum here in New York. Uh, a couple of days after the ending of the conference. Um, the success of the conference will have to be measured in the future, uh, but I think in the, in the context of bringing quite a bit of the world together, uh, we had more newly accredited organizations from across the world, private sector, NGOs and others. We had larger and smaller scale networks here uh, and a suite of uh, high level representatives from government. Um, it was also the largest gathering here at the UN uh, when it comes to a conference. So the UN was bustling for of uh, a lot of activity, and I think that is uh, there's one part of the the conference was really focused on action. There was no negotiation. It was really about committing ourselves as a world, public and private, and better in their coalitions to commit to action. The the second thing I would I would say to so you could say with that at least as the ingredients to be successful. The second thing is that uh, water is being so cross-cutting, uh, connecting to everything life, health, insecurity, our economies, our cities, our infrastructure, our businesses and investment, um, uh, climate, for, of course, and the environment and food and energy. So you see it across uh, everything. I think for the first time at the UN, at that stage, at the end, in the ending on Friday, we saw a message coming from the world, from leaders, public and private, saying, hey, water in this cross-cutting capacity has to be recognized as a global common good, but can also be addressed in a very comprehensive way. And I was listening back to how the co-chairs of the most important dialogues of this conference reported back, and I think I've never heard such a comprehensive, concise message coming from the UN when we were talking about these complex issues. Uh, and I also think that we prevented not to again fall back into our silos. And I think that is too often uh, in our world, you know, we complain and we see also the failure of our fragmented governments, but also our fragmented private sector and finance sector. Uh, and for once, this was bypassed at least but hopefully that bypass shows a way forward that in this far more collaborative and comprehensive way with dedicated leadership and better capacity and organization, we can move ahead. So the actions, the coalitions, public and private from across the world, as well as this concise message on the importance of water and its cross-cutting nature really showed that there is an opportunity that we now really have to capitalize on. Thanks so much, Hank, and it's been inspiring to see the just the sheer numbers, but also the sectors that are showing up for water action, as you said. Um, 700 commitments and growing on the water action agenda. 
Over 6,000 people gathered here in New York representing many, many, many more networks and institutions that are really taking seriously exactly what you're describing as a bypass or breakdown of those silos so that we can come together around this agenda. We're joined this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from, by leading experts and champions that represent a lot of those sectors. And I'm so pleased to introduce, um, starting with Gary White, the co-founder and CEO of Water.org and Water Equity, Usha Rao Manari, our Associate Administrator of the UNDP, United Nations Development Programs, Beth Kolji, the co-founder of Magic Water, great name. Um, Jim Andrew, the Executive Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer of PepsiCo. And before we turn to our esteemed panelists, we have a special message um, from Gary and a familiar face to so many of us, Matt Damon, both an actor and also a co-founder with Gary on Water.org um, and Water Equity on the importance of the UN conference and why this matters to so many people around the world. Please watch this. Hi, I'm Matt Damon, co-founder of Water.org and Water Equity. It's my great pleasure to join you at the UN 2023 Water Conference, a gathering that can change the course for the global water crisis we're facing. Access to safe water, sanitation, and hygiene is the most basic human need for health and well-being, a declared human right. But billions of people around the world still lack access to safe drinking water and a toilet. More than 90% of disasters are water-related, and climate change is adding to that pressure. And our need for water keeps growing, with pressures on fresh water projected to increase by more than 40% by 2050. But despite these challenges, there is still time to break through to a water-secure planet. But we must act now. Hello, I'm Gary White, co-founder of Water.org and Water Equity. The good news is there are solutions. With our organizations, we seek to do more, faster, and in partnership with others to unlock the flow of financing for water and sanitation. Together, we've reached more than 53 million people with access to safe water and sanitation through small, affordable loans. But more is needed, more financing and investment, more innovation, more partnerships, and more ambition. We're encouraged that these are also the goals of this conference, and we are committed to doing our part. In fact, we've launched our most important initiative to date, a water and climate initiative to reach 100 million people living in poverty with safe water and sanitation solutions. So thank you for this opportunity to speak to you all, and we wish everyone a successful conference. Thanks so much. And Gary, maybe just coming to you first. I mean, it's, we want to thank both you and Matt Damon for the championship um, that you've been showing tirelessly for, for many years around water equity and the country level. As you said, we need more partnerships, we need more investment, and we need more ambition. Reaching 100 million people with safe water will, will take a global community. What, what are your thoughts coming out of the conference as well as your ask to the global community on how to achieve such an ambition? Great. Well, thanks, Tanya, for, for having us here. I really appreciate uh, that already we're following up on the conference. So hopefully uh, everything, that, all the energy that came out of that won't be lost as uh, more conversations like this continue to take place. So thanks for convening us. Uh, on this. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, having been in this sector for, uh, well, since the mid-80s, uh, when the water decade was taking place after Mar del Plata, which was the last big water conference for, uh, organized by the UN, we had the, the water decade, and obviously we fell short uh, during that time. So it's good that we're finally, finally bringing the focus back. And, you know, what, some of the things that I saw different from, you know, conferences that I was at back in the 80s uh, is, I think it's important to point out. I think uh, back then it was really just about, you know, about water and about uh, really the uh, local governments and bilaterals and multilaterals trying to, to solve this problem kind of in a vacuum. And obviously the, we fell far short in terms of the capital that was around to, to solve the problem back then, and that was one of the major failures was not mobilizing enough capital. And uh, when I draw the contrast between that and now, uh, capital was definitely on the, on the front burner throughout uh, the convenings of the UN. And frankly, for the last you know, 
five to ten years, capital has been really important, and not just uh, municipal and bilateral, multilateral capital, but the private sector capital. And that's what I see really changing. That's one thing. The second thing I see changing is that climate is front and center now. And there's a potential to leverage a lot that's happening with climate uh, in terms of different funds that are focused on climate and leveraging them and bending them more towards water and, and wastewater treatment as well. And so to me, you know, back in the mid-80s, nobody was talking about climate in the context of water. And so there's a potential to kind of use this confluence to drive much more capital investment into the space. The third thing I see is, is corporates. You know, uh, you know, we have Jim here from PepsiCo uh, representing just one of you know, hundreds, if not thousands of corporates now that yes. are yes. leaning into this uh, in a big way. And you know, back in the 80s, you know, NGOs and government and corporations didn't really spend that much time talking to each other. And now corporations are a central part of the mix. And I see that manifest in really positive ways like the Water Resilience Coalition, which is part of the, you know, the UN Global Compact, uh, you know, with more than 30 companies now, Fortune 100 companies especially, really focused on this. They have a goal of leading into this in a way to reach 300 million people with water and sanitation uh, over the next 15 years. And so what we're doing in partnership with them around finance is helping them and their corporations use their balance sheets uh, to invest in water uh, and sanitation infrastructure in a way that gives investors an opportunity for financial returns uh, as well as huge impact around uh, the SDGs and, and ESG. And so I have a lot of hope with so many more, uh, you know, like I say, this confluence of events coming together that we will be able to uh, achieve real impact. And I know we're planning on doing our part with that 100 million uh, person commitment. Uh, we're, we're, our intent is to raise a billion dollars in terms of water and climate uh, funds to be able to, to do that. And so I hope that uh, but what we're doing and what the collaboration, all these different partnerships are doing, will allow us to, to meet the SDG number six as we go forward. Gary, thanks so much. So climate finance, um, you know, thinking about the cross-cutting ways in which these solutions can actually come together and, and redirect some of that investment, as you're saying, into solutions that include water. Um, maybe we can come back to some of the, the aspects of that return on water, uh, return on uh, your, your investment in terms of water in just a moment. Usha, I, I wonder if I could come to you. Um, I know you've been a, a longtime advocate and champion of, of water issues, both at the global level, at the country level. From UNDP's perspective, and as we just heard from Hank, this breakdown of fragmentation across the UN agencies and across the UN community, do you see new models of multilateralism and, and sort of collective action coming as a result of last week's convenings? Thank you, Tanya, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, with old friends, Gary, how are you? I haven't seen you in a long time. It's good to see you, Jim. You too. Um, um, Tanya, I think you raised some important issues, and I enjoyed uh, very much what Gary said, and it resonated completely. Here's the thing, and, and what Hank said. As Hank said, the conference happened after, I think, 47 years, which in and of itself is, is, a, is, is, a, is a huge uh, victory. The conference created, if you will, a focus uh, on water, which is much more connected in nature, and not as fragmented and reactive as it has been. So it's not that we've lost focus on water, we all live with it every day, but the, but, the, but the action on water has been fragmented and it has been reactive. When there's a crisis, somebody does something about it, when there's not, we don't think about it. What the conference, I believe, has done is, 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 is put a spotlight on, on a few things. One, how to look at water differently. So far, when we think of water, we tend to think of access, we think, tend to think of blue water. Uh, and so on and so forth. The conference and some of the reports, like the report of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water, has pointed out that you have to look at water as an entire cycle, a whole water cycle, starting with green water and blue water, green infrastructure and rain infrastructure. Everything should be taken account uh, into when you look at water. Second, it also proposed that nobody, no country, no company, 
can deal with the water issue by itself just simply because it is, it is such an interconnected resource. And so collective action, whether it's multilateral or otherwise or multi-stakeholder, is absolutely uh, necessary. Third, it also brought to the top that the way we think about water has to be much more um, granular and much more focused. So whether we're talking about finance, whether we're talking about governance, innovation, social inclusion, it's not about looking at these in silos as unfortunately we tend to do, but to bring them together in a much more connected way. So for example, how do you look at bringing policy and finance and social interventions in order to find solutions in the water sector? And finally, and I'm going to stop there, I think what, what, what the conference uh, showed was an enormous, and Hank, you mentioned this, an enormous political will to do something. What was it? I think 180 or 90 countries uh, uh, have, uh, have uh, participated. There were many agreements, many people, as Hank said, stood up at the closing session and said, we want this to happen. We want this to be the decade of water action. And so I think as a final point, what I'm looking forward to, as you said, as an old water hound, is that we are finally at an inflection point of doing something about an important resource for the next decade. Thanks, and back to you, Tanya. Thanks so much, Usha, and I think it's really encouraging to start to hear that it's not just the, the agendas that need to come together, but like you said, the integration of these levers across policy, finance, technologies, and other innovations that can really help to break those silos and create action on the ground. We also he heard from the Secretary General the uh, announcement on Friday around um, appointing a, a special envoy for water to help coordinate across the various aspects of the UN that would really hold that shared responsibility and coordination role and more to come in the coming months on, on how we see that sort of unfolding as a, as a key lever towards those outcomes. Um, I wanted to switch gears a bit since we've all touched on the role of innovation um, and welcome you, Beth. Uh, you know, the forum has been working through our Uplink platform, which is an open innovation platform together with HCL on fostering uh, a pipeline of innovators or what we're calling aquapreneurs. And a number of these aquapreneurs were brought also to New York to the UN Water Conference last week around this very critical unlock to say, how do we create that enterprise and foster those ecosystems that can help technology solutions already out there and very much the ones we need yesterday to start to look at the scale and impact um, to these challenges. Beth, over to you on the types of solutions you're seeing and what you took away from last week's conference. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and talk uh, on behalf of other interpreters, hopefully, um, and also more so in emerging markets. Um, so, you know, it was mentioned over and over again that the technology we need um, for the water crisis that we are facing already exists. So it's about bridging that gap and actually bringing it to the communities that actually need them. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is financing. Um, so we need, we need financing, we need investment. Uh, but you find that most um, startups in the water sector have unique challenges. Which, um, I'm sorry, you find that most um, startups need um, upfront capital investment. Um, and these have longer paper period. And you find that, you know, and I'm very happy about this because I found a lot of people willing to finance and a lot of investors that are within the water sector. But a lot of conversations were primarily based on investing in large-scale infrastructure and utility companies. Uh, so there's this gap where you know, all these infrastructure and utility companies cannot be able to reach, and that's where the enterprise come in. They're able to, to, to reach the unreachable. Uh, and how do you finance this? Because right now, a lot of people are financing infrastructure and utility. Uh, so for us to scale, to scale and to implement these water solutions, um, as much as the, the public uh, the public entities are required and are necessary, also there is necessity for private utilities. Um, and for these innovative financing solutions are required, um, which are more patient, uh, because most of these um, projects and programs uh, and startups require a huge capital 
investment, uh, you find that, you know, early stage kind of financing for tickets below 250,000 USD are not available. Uh, so creating this gap and finding somebody to create or de risk um, and create this kind of financing is go a huge way in helping enterprise actually help solve this challenge. Beth, thanks so much. And I think you hit on two really important points. One is um, to Usha's earlier remarks around the cycle of water and really understanding what aspects of that are facing some of the most vulnerable communities. And as your technology really looks at um, using atmospheric water generators to provide clean water in arid and semi-arid regions, but that's really reaching people. And what you're describing there is a not a financing as usual or not your mother's financing, right? We're talking about the sort of long-term patient capital that needs upfront de-risking as well as that longer institutional investment that will maintain and support that um, over the long term. So I think, you know, two really important points around getting innovative with not just the, the technologies, but the financing itself. And maybe we can come back to Gary on if he has examples on that. But I did want to come to you, Jim. Of course, PepsiCo has been in the, in, in the discussions around sustainable water management for many, many years, a champion around the world on these issues. Maybe you can help folks understand why Pepsi cares about water sustainability and what you saw last week as a watershed moment on these issues from the private sector. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. Um, if I just a little bit of background to, to answer your first question, you know, why, why does PepsiCo care about water? Um, obviously, we use water in our beverages, but most people don't know that PepsiCo is about 60% food. So we have a very significant agricultural footprint, which obviously uh, employs many, many farmers around the world, but also we touch about 7 million acres. We also have hundreds of production facilities. So for us, water is a fundamental part of our business and, and the people that we touch. You know, we've committed to be net water positive by 2030 globally in our high water risk areas. And we already have plants that are off the water grid, meaning they use no water uh, from the municipal system for hundreds of days. So as you say, water for us is really important. And as I think back on the conference and, you know, I was together really with everybody on this call at one point or another, you know, if I were to just try and boil it down to one thing uh, as a takeaway, it's, it's, and I would just echo the comments everybody else has made, it's the increasing importance and the recognition of the sort of water climate, agriculture, nexus, um, and how those things fit together. And, and, you know, we often think in our own silos, but fundamentally those things have to be, have to be linked. And so the continuing efforts to understand, to quantify, and to be able to really look at you know, as, as Usha said, the water system, but I would say it's even broader, the whole ecological system and how it's related. And to be able to quantify some of the benefits and the co-benefits will help unlock some of the financing, uh, I believe, that Gary and, and Beth talked about. So it, it, to me, the fundamental takeaway was that, and the good news is the increasing realization of how these things are linked. To Hank's point, I also agree you know, was it a successful conference? We're, we're, we're about to find out. Thanks so much, Jim. And maybe just um, staying on that really important message at the end there around the realization of this nexus of climate, agri, and water. I think most people don't realize that agri-food systems are the largest consumer of water um, at 70% and greater in a lot of the geographies, and this is consistent across countries. And as we rethink how we produce and consume food and start to value that water in different ways, what are the what are the messages that we can start to think about around trade-offs? I think people often um, shy away from looking at those trade-offs. And what you're basically describing is that it's a win-win-win. We don't necessarily have to choose. We can achieve net zero. We can achieve regenerative food systems and reduce our water footprint at the same time. Is, am I getting that right? Uh, we, we think that that's right if or and, as, as you know, people want to say. It, it's possible if really a couple of things have to happen. And again, there was a lot of good conversation around this at the meetings. But, you know, I think if I think about from the private sector 
you know, we need to make bolder commitments as the private sector, not just in our own operations, but really, you know, thinking about the entire network of our suppliers, our value chain, and also watersheds. You know, this is a team sport. And if we ever forget that, we're not going to be successful. And that's true for everyone. You know, no government, no private company, no NGO can do this by themselves, because really this all takes place at a watershed level. Water is a global problem that's intensely local. And so I think we can do it if we don't forget that. As a private company, we need to hold our whole supply chain set of partners, you know, to the hold them to the same commitments that we're making. And then I think all together, we need to lean into, and this gets to your point, we need to lean into local advocacy because we need, you know, Hank's been very articulate about this over the years. We need smart governance. And I'll just give you one example. You know, we have places where we, we wash potatoes, for example. We wash potatoes, we take that water and we treat it back to better than WHO drinking water standards. And then we use it to wash potatoes again. Makes sense, truly circular water, it's great. And in some parts of the world, we're actually not allowed to do that. So having advocacy that supports all these things we're talking about important. So bolder commitments, making sure that it's a team sport and making sure together we get the right advocacy and regulations in place. I think that's exactly what will allow us to do what you said and to really make water circular and to, to serve all these trade offs, address these trade offs and serve these requirements that we all are talking about. Thanks so much, Jim. And Gary, maybe then just coming back to you around that water is a local issue and um, how we rethink not just the integration of policy and technologies and partnerships to unlock finance, but what are the ways in which aquapreneurs and the wider ecosystem that's really looking to get in the trenches and solve these problems to reach 100 million people and more, how are they able to unlock finance? What are you seeing that's promising and, and how did last week sort of propel that forwards? The water puns are just endless, by the way, so we'll have to just continue to, to work around them. Sure. <laughs> No, I I see this vast network right uh, around water. Everything from you know what Beth is talking about and the need for for capital for the aquapreneurs, uh, all the way up to you know larger infrastructure that needs to happen and, and be put in place as well. So I think uh, that what what I see what we're trying to do because we have heard through the decades you know that there's just so much need out there and so little capital focusing on it. And after hearing, you know, people lament for years that there's no bankable deals, there's really nothing out there that, that will, will work. It's financially viable for, for the capital markets. You know, we suspended disbelief and said, you know, let's figure it out if there is a market out there and if we can do that. And that's exactly what we've done with water.org and water equity. You know, water.org is a, as a, you know, a philanthropy oriented organization goes out there and, and corrects the market failures, provides the technical assistance, works with with, uh, you know, uh, local financial institutions to start lending micro loans for, for water and sanitation. And so that that kind of you know, creating the financial plumbing that I call it. So we, get, we create that financial plumbing between the global capital markets and women making just a few dollars a day who need access to water and sanitation. And that's resulted in over $4 billion in microloans reaching 52 million people. And that's one way, I think. But when I look at, as we look at how do we scale this up, looking to the capital markets with water equity, which is the world's first asset manager that's dedicated exclusively to water and sanitation in, in low and middle income countries. And water equity now has pulled together more than $350 million in committed capital from investors that have the opportunity for a financial return to be able to then you know, complete that circle. And what I really see is a lot of our local financial institutions that we work with around the world are not just doing microfinance now. They're also looking to enterprises like Beth is talking about. So we've been helping 
those types of financial institutions understand the local water and sanitation market and where there is a potential to invest and, and get financial returns. And so I think that as we look uh, to where the capital is and some of the, you know, the corporates part of the Water Resilience Coalition, they see the potential now to come into this, like I said, with their balance sheets and invest in this. I'm very grateful to PepsiCo, who for years supported us to reach millions of people, uh, particularly in India, but around the world. You know, that funding that they gave us helped us to lay the tracks for this asset manager. So using philanthropy to kind of set things in motion and nudging the markets a little bit so that this can really, again, pardon the pun, <laughs> Tanya, can flood capital into this. And if we can now, if we can connect the dots between, you know, the capital markets and people making a few dollars a day and financial returns can be had, then it's on us. You know, it's not, we're not talking about scaling up charity to get everybody water. If we can do it with the capital markets, there's no excuse for not making investments in, in people uh, who need these services. Gary, thank you so much. I think exactly. So we're looking at the cycle of water, but that cycle of finance and how it actually has a role for so many of the stakeholders. I think people are also trying to shift from the what to the how around where the competencies, strengths, and then that complementary role can play that sort of unlocking outcome. I, I do want to recognize that, Hank, you've been hearing from a number of these experts around the level of ambition, around the, the good examples that have been out there that need scaling, around the passion of the innovators out there that want to get in the trenches and problem solve. What's encouraging you here, and, and what more should we ask the global community to be paying attention to? And thanks, Tanya, and thanks all for uh, uh, your commitment, not only uh, in these last days here in New York and now again uh, the days after, but in the years leading up to this conference. It took us 46 years, so uh, uh, for us, it, we, we said we better make best use of this uh, moment, and I think we were able to get that. I think over we, this morning I checked 709 uh, voluntary commitments. The challenge, of course, with that is that uh, in the context of uh, all these relationships, eh? you can't silo your approaches. Uh, before you know it, these commitments are like a postmodernistic flower garden. They bloom for a season and they're gone. So if you don't bring them together, are able to validate and evaluate and follow up, there's no replication, there's no watershed moment, eh? there's no flooding of funding going. It, it's just fragmentation all over the place. So. Um, one and a half years ago, we said we have to bring those commitments together in like a global pact for water. Well, that scared the hell out of the world because a pact looks like a legally binding instrument. And before you know it, governments and private sector don't want to be binded to, you know, uh, a commitment. So it's now this water action agenda. Uh, it has a structure. It has a follow up. But accountability is going to be of, great, of greater importance, not only accountability in the fact are we delivering, but I would say accountability in the fact are we capitalizing on this? Are these the opportunities that we should invest in? Can, where is the opportunity for scale and replication? So this, this can indeed lead to flooding investments and solutions across the world. And I think that's the moment of truth. Is such an agenda uh, in contrast to a negotiation better if we focus on the solutions and the partnerships that are needed? What is then the governance that we need around it, uh, the environment that is safe enough? And I think the conference showed that water provides that more or less secure environment where it's okay from governments and private sector and finance and NGOs and communities to come together and say, hey, these are my needs, these are my interests collectively. If I invest in water, they can be met and dealt with. Now the question is, are these solutions fitting? Are they solving tomorrow's problems? And where are the changes that are needed in uh, society, in the environment, in governance, in financing way, in ways of collaboration, to see indeed uh, scaling a replication of those solutions? Because the challenge is massive. Uh, and I think uh, to add to that challenge, uh, Anusha is uh, one of our commissioners on the Global Commission on the Economics and Water, too. Uh, the Global Commission showed us that while water, of course, is felt, eh, the crisis is felt very local, and we see the problem in our, in our rivers, eh, so in our streams, but also in our, uh, in our groundwater, which is always transboundary. Now water 
through these uh, atmospheric rivers, water is transported across continents. So that means you will have water deficits on one and a water flow in the other. So all of a sudden, water turns into a very geographically bound way, something that is global and therefore multilateral. And how are we going to be able, able to deal with that, knowing that with climate change on top of that, and the IPCC came up with their report last week too, this is not going to be less problematic. So we, we need to look at across those scales to solutions that are about innovation and technology, public and private partnership, that are about governance and finance, and that are also about multilateralism. And there's nothing against, you know, at the moment, eh, I can only call USHA at the UN, and for the rest, nobody picks up the phone when it comes to water. So we have to figure out how to do this differently, eh? organize ourselves around it. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm against more bureaucracy. I, I want effective coordination and uh, uh, focus on implementation. But nobody, hey, that's not, not going to work in the context of this crisis. Fantastic. And I mean, I think that it, there's a clear message around the, the resolute that's needed at the global level around the governance that you describe, and yet the agility and the the dynamism we're going to need to continue to foster in terms of local water action. Um, and yeah, I'm encouraged. I, yeah, please, bit? Hank. That, hundreds of people were working on a conference. It scared. I, I I woke up. Well, if I had sleep at all last week, I think like we're only working on a conference. We're not working on water. So the day after, who's actually picking up the phone when we are talking about water? Well, you are, but it's tough. Eh? Uh, we made a conference successful knowing that everybody came together and there's more or less an agenda and, a, and an agreed upon uh, conclusion that, yes, water is cross-cutting. It touches upon everything and everyone, everywhere, at every t uh, point in time. It means that the only way to deal with it is very comprehensive and a very committed way looking at the longer term uh, but the day after we still sit in our same systems in our same silos eh? the solutions by themselves are not enough to address that fragmentation that we have in society it has to be more and the question is now beyond the conference because there's no negotiative process there's nothing left now there's no mandate with nobody the only thing is voluntary commitment is that enough to drive this agenda forward? And I question it. Yeah. No, I mean, I think and, you're... Yeah, Usha, do you want to oh, come I in? I just jump in. Oh, I, I just wanted to jump in to say, like, how are we going to hold our feet to the, to the fire? And I think we should be talking about this, and we will be talking about it and convening some of our partners uh, during the United Nations General Assembly in September in Climate Week. So I think that's a good first step, yeah. Hank, to see how much is actually getting done, what of those commitments has actually started making progress. And that's the only way, you know, if we call people on the carpet and, and come back and say, where are you with your commitment? That is going to be really important. Yeah. Okay. Usha, I can come to you next. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and thank you, Hank. I feel a very strong need to defend the bureaucratic world in which I live. So the, the advantage of the conference, uh, and I completely agree with what you said, Hank, uh, but the advantage and the strongest point of the conference was that it occurred. It brought global attention to a topic that is being considered in a very fragmented fashion, right? What the conference did was brought a focus to the subject at the highest level, which is the, you know, the politicians, the member states who said, oh, my God, this is it. So I think there is advantage in that. However, from what you were saying, we can't therefore rest on our laurels and say what a brilliant conference. And yes, it's a conference. We all talk to each other. We have to create this water action decade amongst ourselves. Not it's not that the U.N. can do it or that Pepsi can do it or Gary or Beth can do it. All of us have to come together to create action on the ground. And what does that mean? So. Uh, Jim, you were talking about how water is connected to food and climate. Absolutely correct. At, from where I sit at the UNDP, the water is the one connecting issue that connects all 17 SDGs. That's how we're looking at it. 
name anyone. There's not even one that does not have water as a significant part of it. And, and uh, Tanya started with this. Today, water has become a point of insecurity on the planet. Six out of seven people feel insecure in the world today. And a large part of that is water and climate security. This is a huge development from where we were, let's say, a decade or two decades ago. And the final point, Tanya, just to uh, echo in on, on, on what I guess Hank was saying, and even Jim, yes, like climate, right, uh, water is now being considered uh, at the level of some sort of global, in, global architecture. But it is a very local issue. So, but I think that global architecture is absolutely necessary to focus attention, to focus solutions, and then bring it down uh, to the country level. So I'm thinking, for example, Jim, of you know, the climate architecture we have globally compared to the NDCs at the country level. And, we ha and, you know, and the net zero and whatnot, which is inevitably at the country and company level. And I was on a panel with um, the CEO of Veolia, I guess, last week. And she was talking about, well, why can't we do the same for water, including some sort of water net zero? So what I'm trying to say is water needs a global focus and architecture that it has not unfortunately had. I believe looking at it as a cycle and everything else that Hank was saying will, will hopefully move towards creating that architecture. But we have to come back down to the country level and Gary and Beth and, and, and yourself and all of you have to operate at that level. Back to you, Tanya. Thank you. Thanks, Usha. And maybe in the spirit of Hank's challenge to ourselves, but also to the global community on how we ensure that fragmentation doesn't continue, maybe I can come to each of you for, you know, it's Tuesday after the conference. What is the one thing, um, amongst many, I imagine, but what is the one thing that you are really inspired to do and take forward through your institution, your sector, um, and we can go around the group. I'd love to start with Beth. Uh, over to you. You heard a number of ways in which we can support our aquapreneurs and this wider ecosystem, but what's inspiring you on action? Sorry for that. Uh, so for me, I think the UN Water Conference was um, was a way, for me, I felt re-energized because, you know, I have worked in water. Um, I have faced water insecurities myself. Sometimes you wake up and you have to decide, will I take a shower today? Because, you know, do I even have enough water? So I have lived through that process. So for me, when I attended the UN Water Conference, it gave me reassurance that government and bigger institutions are actually willing uh, to do action. And, you know, action for water is a collective action and everybody p fits into this puzzle. So I have a role to play. Big corporates uh, like um, PepsiCo has a role to play. Everyone at their local level has a role to play. Uh, and for me, it was just a way to be energized and, you know, to feel that actually I can work with like the government of Kenya. Previously, I would never go anywhere near the government because of the obvious reasons. The bureaucracy, you know, they will stall and it will take longer. So for a startup, that is not ideal. But now I realize that for, for me to succeed in what I'm doing, I have to be very inclusive, even the government, to talk to them, to understand, uh, you know, how we can work together. Uh, but at the same time, water issues also, the way you, you work, you must be very inclusive because water issues affect each gender differently. They affect each age group differently, and, and especially when it comes to, you know, emerging markets. You find, you know, women have their own water story. Children have their own water story. You know, everybody is affected by water differently. So also understanding these complexities of water uh, will go a long way and will, you know, help in understanding water and the solutions around them. Beth, thanks so much, and thanks for everything you're doing uh, every day to to impact the lives of people, but also the the paving of the way for more entrepreneurs to learn from this and support this type of scale up. Um, Jim, let me come to you next. You've talked about water being a team sport, and I'm wondering where your energy is for the next phase of water action. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. Um, and you can ask my team, and they'll tell you I'm already acting on it. it it's really accelerate. How do we use, you know, as, as, a, as a corporation, as PepsiCo, how do we use our size and our scale to accelerate all the kinds of things we've been talking about? 
and and you know I've always, I always say it's three things. It's act, act, act. The first is act broadly. It's a big problem. It's a global problem, and we have to be acting at least at the watershed level. And I think you know to Hank's point, there's atmospheric rivers. To Usha's point, it's multi. You know, but we have to act. And we have to act broadly at the same time acting locally. The second is we have to act together. You know, I, I, I told the group last week if you're no matter how good the work is that we're doing, if we're doing it by ourselves, we're doing it wrong because these things require collective action and collaboration. And that's hard. That's hard for a lot of companies, for a lot of countries, for a lot of NGOs, but we have to act together. And then the third is we have to act now, right? We have to accelerate and move faster. And so that's really where my action is, is, you know, act broadly, act together and act now. Thanks, Jim. Gary, over to you, uh, uh, to you and if you would like on behalf of you and Matt. <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, to me, you know, I, I'm not saying anything new here because everybody's talking about it. It's, it's collaboration and, and connection. You know, I think it's, you know, to me, collaboration is kind of a broad thing. Connection is something very specific. And I think that what we want to do is to be able to connect, you know, those sources of philanthropic and uh, investment capital with people making a few dollars a day. And we have to go about that in very concrete ways. And I think that's, that's what we're doing. You know, if, if a few years ago, once we struck upon this concept that women living in poverty were willing and able to pay for financial through water, for water services, if they had access to affordable finance, that was a breakthrough for us in terms of creating those connections. And so I recast us, you know, water.org is as much a finance institution now as it is a water NGO. I mean, what NGO has ever gone out and created an asset manager out of thin air, you know, and now uh, is on its way to a billion dollars of, of committed capital, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, and so we're trying to connect in very concrete ways so that people can see water and sanitation not just as a, as a problem to be solved, but as a market to be served. And I think that is what we see in these connections and these collaborations with, you know, over 150 financial institutions around the world who are doing this on the ground in these countries uh, and all of the investors that we have now on the other end of that financial plumbing. And uh, that's for me, as somebody that's been in this sector for so long and has been to so many conferences and heard a lot of ideas about how this organization should do this and that one should do that. It's like we wanted to kind of come in and do it and then branch out uh, and serve as an example to lots of, of capital sources that could now see that it is viable to invest in poor women who need water and sanitation and then greatly scale up the, the capital by kind of shining a light on this path. Fantastic. Thanks, Gary. And, and thanks for continuing to reinforce the finance cycle across the water cycle. And we'll hold you to the climate week and looking forward to seeing water.org's uh, leading by doing um, example there. And Usha, over to you. I think uh, other than asking your colleagues at the UN to answer the phone when Hank calls, what can we count on uh, for what happens next? Well, I've now instructed everyone at the UN to pick up as long as they see Hank's phone number um, on, the, on the dial there. Look, you know, as a bureaucrat, I hate these, what is the one takeaway, one sort of questions, but let me, let, me, let me try to answer that. So I think one takeaway is exactly what everybody's saying. We have to come together more, um, but collab, you know, words like collaboration, cooperation, these are easy words, right? I remember, Tanya, when I founded the 2030 Water Resources Group, there was one uh, request I made for all the CEOs who were around the table with me that intimidated me to death. So there was the Pepsi CEO, Jim, there was the Coca-Cola one, there was uh, Peter Brabeck, et cetera. And I said, I have one request to you all. Please, when you come into the conference room, please leave <clears throat> your flags at the door. We all have flags. We all have flags, and we love to bring them in and wave them vigorously. But in order to create solutions around, in a collective way, around these incredibly important issues like water, we have to leave the flags at the door and come in to solve an issue or to find a solution. Thank you. Back, back to you, Tanya. 
Thanks so much, Usha. And I think the Water Resources Group, in your example, you know, been active since uh, 12, 13 years now and now in 14 countries. So I think that advice and that request has definitely generated a step change in how these partnerships are starting to form at the country level um, with much more to achieve in these coming years. So, Hank, over to you for the final word. What What is giving you hope and promise and what are you doing next? No, I think... I'd I I've more or less was born hopeful, so uh, from an <laughs> activist mother and an engineer father, so there's no way uh, to do this differently. But also this conversation again and the commitment that's shown by uh, uh, Gary, Jim, Beth and uh, Usha and yourself uh, here at the forum uh, really shows the optimism that's behind it. I also think that that was also coming from the last three days and the whole week here in New York, there is in the context of this massive crisis that is only, you know, you, you can talk about it as only becoming bigger and bigger, there's a huge opportunity when it comes to water. And that is what I've, I've always liked in the water space. The moment you have a conversation water, you bring everybody together, and it is always about solutions. There's always an opportunity. A dollar invested in, in water always trickle down, trickles down somewhere in your in your. Uh, either in your own supply chain or in your watershed, in your communities, and uh, you know you find it somewhere with better health, a better environment, opportunities to again invest and reinvest and scale and replicate. So I think that's the hope. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that uh, after all these years, I, um, uh, I I want to. I'm always a little bit impatient. <laughs> I really want to see that action, that governance in place, and uh, and and the. the to be able to ensure that there is that follow-up. But uh, uh, Gary, you're right. Uh, we concluded also Friday that not only in September we will see each other on water in the SDG summit and high level week, the year after with the summit of the future. Uh, again, the UN will uh, agree that water will take a critical role as well as in the World Social Forum, which will be a, a year after. So three years in a row, at least, we will so see water as a cross-cutting issue in the UN agenda as well as that I'm pretty sure with your leadership, your collective leadership, we will see it happening on the ground. And I look forward in my next capacity, not as an envoy, but something else, uh, to help and seek uh, the opportunity to move that ahead as well. So thanks, Tanya, here at the forum, and thank you all for joining uh, and your actions. Thanks so much, Hank, and a, a special thanks on behalf of the world, if I may, to the remarkable inspiration and individual leadership that you have shown to this agenda. I want to thank our panelists um, for, for your leadership and inspiration, and we're looking forward to getting quite serious on this. There's no green without blue. Water is a team sport, um, and I think the puns will carry us through the tough times, so let's do that together. The World Economic Forum is very committed to this agenda and bringing that fragmentation into a much more connected and coordinated way forward. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.